Okay, so um, going through the next unit, we're going to start with just kind of describing what an aerosol is and talking about the different kind of nebulizers, DPIs, MDIs, which hopefully you guys got a chance to see um, some examples of in clinical. So <clears throat> big thing, um, a definition of an aerosol is particles, either solid or liquid, that are suspended in air. And um, the reason I want to draw your attention to this is because I think we use aerosol therapy so interchangeably with nebulizers that we forget that aerosols are also our MDIs and our DPIs, um, any particles, solid or liquid, that are suspended in air. That is the definition that you guys kind of want to really stick to, even though aerosols are commonly associated with nebulizers. That is not the limit to their definition. Um, the other thing we're going to be talking about a lot is particle size, which uh, the unit that we're using for that is microns, which I'm guessing if you guys have been <laughs> looking at the massive debate online and various other places about COVID and masks and micron sizes, you're probably pretty familiar with this unit uh, currently. Um, most therapeutic aerosols are heterodispersed, and all that means is that they have more than one size of um, either solid or liquid particle in their mixture, and that they're not all the same micron size. Uh, another definition that I'm going to draw your attention to is MMAD, which is the Mass Median Aerodynamic Diameter. Um, the board likes this one, so definitely uh, note card this guy. But basically, if they're looking at a particular medication or they're um, looking to see uh, where it goes in, as far as like lung deposition, they'll determine that a certain micron size or the mass median aerodynamic diameter, the average micron size goes to a certain part of the lung. And then that's kind of how they decide how effective um, an aerosol is. The other one is um, GSD or ge uh, geometric standard deviation. So just like the difference between the measurable size of microns, that one is not as common to come up in those random questions, but I'm just throwing it on there. Flashcards are fun. Um, I like this slide because I feel like when you have kind of an idea of how big a micron is, uh, it just puts it into perspective. So this is showing the average human hair is 150 microns. Um, and then it just kind of goes through all these different examples to give you an idea of how big they are. So the big argument with COVID is that the virus is like essentially this small, right? So 0 0.001 to 0 0.01 microns for viruses. And so the common argument I hear is that wearing a mask is like trying to keep mosquitoes out of a chain link fence. Um, they're missing a big component here in the sense that most droplet sizes, which is what the virus is carried in, are three to five microns, and the masks actually do um, keep three to five micron particles out. And once it lands on the mask, it's not as though the virus is going to wiggle its way through in some sort of weird uh, worm-like fashion. It pretty much stays on the mask. So if that mask isn't there and it's, oh, I don't know, your lip or nose, um, that's a different situation. So that's kind of that big... Um, misunderstanding that people have. Uh, just throwing it in there since we're talking about microns. Okay, so for lung deposition, we're going to be talking about the emitted dose. Again, these all should probably land on a flashcard for you guys. The emitted dose is just how much leaves the device. The respirable dose is how much actually reaches your lower airways. Uh, deposition is just a fun way of saying landing on the surface. Um, the things that kind of control how well that happens are particle size. You guys can reference this in Egan. Inspiratory flow, breathing pattern, uh, respiratory rate, IDE ratio, um, settling time, which is just a fancy way of saying a breath hold. Um, and then residual volume is how much is left in the device um, after you're done. So deposition, landing on the surface. There's three things that we're going to be talking about when it comes to um, medication's ability to deposit in the lungs uh, or really other places like your mouth, your throat, your nose. So inertial impaction, sedimentation, and diffusion. Um, so inertial impaction is going to be greater than five microns, okay? That's, that's just the definition that you're going to have to know 
greater than five microns, you're looking at inertial impaction. Um, that is going to be your upper airways. And when you think about that, it's almost like if you're thinking about a large boat that can't turn quickly, if you think about a larger micron that's going into your airways, um, it's not going to be able to navigate down into those smaller airways. It's got enough momentum that it's going to basically impact, um, into the wall of your upper airways. And that's as far as it's going to go. Sedimentation is your two to five microns. That's going to be your lower airways. So, Sedimentation, if you can kind of visualize it, these are your smaller particles, so they're going to float a little bit more freely. They're not going to run into the walls of your airways as much. They're not going to be as limited um, by that heavy momentum that those larger microns have, and they're going to kind of settle into your lower airways gradually. Diffusion, that's the less than three migraines, so they're the really, really small ones. And um, those are the ones that actually make it down to your alveoli. When you think about how far down that is and how many twists and turns, this is going to be those really, really small particles that are going to be able to diffuse through potential um, barriers, walls, uh, things like that. Um, hang on one second. I lost my slide. Okay. Um, exhaled, the ones that you just exhale back out because they're so small, 0 0.5 to 1 micron. So that's just brought right back out of your lungs. Um, and then you want to kind of like match your particle size, your treatment tar uh, target. And all that's saying is different medications or different delivery devices uh, target different micron sizes. So if you want to get to the lower areas, you're going to target that um, two to five. If you want the upper airways, which there are definitely medications like lidocaine and things like that, you're going to want those greater than five microns. So you kind of design your drug and design your delivery device to give you what you're looking for. So for aerosol therapy, um, there's kind of two common headings that you guys are going to hear. So for bland aerosols, what you're talking about there is humidity. You're not talking about delivering a medication. You're talking more about the moisture. So there's two kinds that we're going to eventually talk about. One is a bland nebulizer, which means there's no uh, medication in there, but you are delivering an aerosol that is designed um, to create humidity. Um, the other bland aerosol is a humidifier, and that's um, one that you are going to see on ventilators or blenders or um, other high flow devices. And the big difference is that a nebulizer creates an aerosol, whereas a humidifier creates molecular water. And the reason we care about the difference between those is um, nebulizers that create aerosols create those bigger particle sizes. Like we were talking about those five microns or the three to five. And when you have those larger microns, they can carry more infection agents. Whereas if you have a normal humidifier, like what you have on like a blender or vent that just creates molecular water, they are not very good carriers for bacteria or viruses. So we like to make that distinct, um, distinct, distinction when we're talking about those. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, how uh, nebulizers and in general uh, bland aerosols can be an infection risk as we kind of move through this. And in the third unit, we talk a lot about humidifiers, so we'll touch on that then too. The other big heading is medicated aerosols. So we have things called atomizers, which we'll talk about and you guys will see pictures of. Nebulizers, which you guys have probably seen the small volume neb, which is what you use for like your duo neb, your albuterol, that hopefully you guys got a chance to have hands on with in the clinical setting. We also have things called large volume jet nebs. Those are one of your Venturi systems that we're going to learn about. Um, they're pretty low usage now. They are very, very common when I first came out of school, but they've really kind of gone away um, in larger facilities now that we have blenders to kind of take the place. Um, and we'll kind of go over that when we talk about it in lab. But they are still commonly used in a lot of rural settings. Um, so it's important that we um, know about them and how they work. Um, there's ultra, also ultrasonic nebulizers, which I end up taking out of the other PowerPoint, um, mainly because these have also really gone away. Uh, they were limited in the fact that they created heat and that would sometimes break down the medications that they were giving. So um, you can kind of disregard that one. I should have deleted that out. I deleted it out of the second PowerPoint. So we can kind of just 
disregard that one. Um, mesh nebulizers, which we'll talk about in detail as we get into like some of the specialty nebs, but that's another way that you can deliver a medicated aerosol. You also have your inhalers, your pressurized meter dose inhaler, and then um, your dry powder inhaler or your DPI. So we'll go through different examples of that, especially in lab. You guys will get some hands-on. We are going to talk about something called the SPAG or small particle aerosol generator. This is also something that has essentially gone away in clinical use. The reason I am going to teach you guys a small um, little snippet about it is because it still comes up in a couple of board questions and I don't want you guys to get blindsided. So this is going to end up being something that's like um, pretty, pretty small detail, but the details will help you get an answer right on your boards. Um, clinical practice, this has really kind of gone away and hopefully eventually it'll go away on the boards. Um, this is just a figure in Egan that I like to use because it shows um, the, dip, the different deposition of medication in the lungs for dry powder inhalers, which is about 27%, uh, meter dose inhaler versus a meter dose inhaler with a holding chamber. And if you look, if you use just an MDI, which is just your puffer, I guess is how you could think about that since you guys aren't looking at it right now with an image. Um, 9% gets in your lungs. When you add a valve holding chamber or a spacer or however you want to put that, it goes up to 20%. So it doubles the deposition in your lungs. So that's why we encourage that a lot in clinical use. And we're going to talk a lot about in um, lab and in class, a lot about the different devices and the technique used to deliver each device. Um, because a lot of what we do in clinical practice is education. Uh, our patients have a lot of different medications at home. They have DPIs, MDIs, they have NEBs, um, steroids, uh, bronchodilators, and most of the time they don't really know what does what and they don't actually have proper coordination. And so when you can come in and kind of fix that for them and educate them, it's really a game changer for their quality of life. Uh, this shows you a NEB, about 12% gets to lungs. So this is a graph that I would be familiar with. So we talked a little bit about the atomizer. <clears throat> this is essentially what an atomizer looks. There's different variations. They're pretty low use in clinical practice right now. They kind of um, used to look like the old perfume bottles, or that's what it reminds me of with these little bulbs here. Now they're more like this. The only time that I think that they ever come up now is um, some of the old school doctors for bronchoscopies still like to use an atomizer to develop to uh, deliver the lidocaine. Um, so this is a delivery device that's designed to do five microns. Uh, it's supposed to hit the upper airway. It's used to numb the upper airway for if you're having a procedure that would make you gag or things like that. So that's where the atomizer comes in. Pretty low use, a very specific use. You're looking at the higher microns and you're looking at the upper airway. The small volume jet nebulizer, which you guys Hopefully you've had a chance to see. This just kind of shows you the internal structure with like a baffle here, because we're going to talk about that. This is where the air comes in that you hook up to the flow meter, and then this is your med in the internal cup. So the fill volume is designed to hold about three to five milliliters of medication. Uh, it doesn't work well if you have less than two mils, and the reason why is there's a residual volume um, or a dead volume that's left over after the medication is sputtering and done. I'm sure you guys have noticed if you've tipped it out onto the paper towel, but there's just a certain amount of volume that's left in there that just does not get inhaled and does not get nebulized. And it's between 0.5 mils and 2.2 mils. So if you have less than two mils, you're pretty much almost at that dead volume or that residual volume. The flow rate recommendations is used between six and 10 liters per minute. We target eight and I think Mayo does as well. If you increase the flow, you're gonna decrease the treatment size and you're gonna make a smaller particle size. If you decrease the flow outside of this, you're gonna have larger particles. And that's important to realize because if you're not paying attention where you set it, if you change the particle size, you're gonna change the deposition in the lungs. So definitely go by the manufacturer recommendation and we do eight because it's right in the, in the middle. These are just some pictures of like wit. You'll hear commonly, oh, it's okay if your kid cries when they're doing their nebulizer, when they're doing their MDI, because they get more medication. Now, to be honest, sometimes kids cry and there's just nothing you can do about it. But if you're looking at this picture versus this picture, 
Um, which one do you think is going to be better? And then down here, we're looking at a gentleman who's doing a nebulizer and there's a reservoir tube here. That's what that's called. And this kiddo is doing the same kind of neb without that tubing. And just kind of trying to assess which one you think is going to have better lung deposition and get more of that medication. So if you look, um, this just kind of gives you an idea if you have an MDI and neb that is blow by, which just means you hold it near the child's face or you hold it near the adult's face, this is how much is getting into the lung. If you have an MDI and or neb in a screaming child, um, sorry, apparently I'm very click happy today. This is what the lung deposition looks like. If you have an MDI or neb with a tight mask and quiet breathing, this is what it looks like, and this is what it looks like. So you can see that that tight mass quiet breathing is the best lung deposition for both the MDI and the NEB. So when you're looking back at these pictures again, this is the one that's better. Again, these are kids. If the kid's crying, there's not much you can do about it. Um, and then for this one, the big difference is, is all of this neb that's just kind of wafting out into the wind, if you have this reservoir tubing, it kind of holds that exhaled medication and allows them to rebreathe it in. So less just kind of goes out to the atmosphere and more gets re-inhaled back when you have that reservoir tubing. So that's what it's showing there. You increase the medication delivery by about 5 to 10%. So when you're instructing a nebulizer to a patient, um, sometimes you'll have patients that just take really giant uh, breaths as they're taking their neb, almost like they're going to pass out by the end of it. You can just tell them they can just do normal tidal breathing. You do not need to take these giant breaths in to get an effective um, deposition of medicine in the lungs. For the device interface, a mouthpiece with a reservoir is best. Now, those new power nebs don't necessarily need a reservoir, the ones that we use, but some of the older ones do, and you guys will get a chance to see those in lab and get a chance to see those um, probably in clinical practice as well, so you can kind of make a differentiation of what I'm talking about in your mind. Face masks with nebs, although necessary sometimes because of your patient's limitations or like if they're a kid, are not ideal because most of that medication ends up on their nose or on their mouth, not in their lungs. So if you do have to do a mask, um, trying to instruct them to open their mouth and breathe through their mouth is the best way to get that medication into their lungs. But really, anytime you can use a mouthpiece, you should really be trying to use a mouthpiece. Um, Blow-by used to be more commonly used with kiddos um, to prevent crying and things like that. Now it's pretty strongly discouraged because it just, you don't get very much medication. So whether you use a mask or mouthpiece, you're always going to instruct your patient to breathe through their mouth, but specifically with a mask, really make sure that they're opening their mouth because it, it makes a big difference for their ability to get that medication. The other neb that we're going to look at is the breath actuated nebulizer or band neb, which I'm pretty sure that's what they use at Mayo. And what makes this interesting is it only nebulizes on inspiration. So you don't have that wasted kind of the neb just blowing into the wind. The patient, when they inhale, the neb actuates. And then when they exhale, the neb shuts off. And so that's how it works. Um, it's good for a variety of medications. It's going to really increase your respirable dose. And the reason it's going to increase that a lot is, again, it's shutting off on exhalation. So every time they inhale, they get the medicine. When they're exhaling, it's shutting off. So it's not just blowing into the wind. Um, it does decrease treatment time. Some protocols actually limit it to five minutes. Um, I haven't used one in a long time, so it's hard for me to know exactly how long they run. But either way, um, it's probably pretty similar to the ones at Gunderson. And then the big thing is you don't have as much occupational exposure. So a standard NEB, 60% of the dose goes into the atmosphere. So as a respiratory therapist that's giving several different kinds of NEBs and multiple NEBs a day, the 60% that's going out into the atmosphere is 60% that we are breathing in. So from um, an occupational exposure standpoint, these NEBs are much, much better because the, the medication is limited more to the patient, not so much the healthcare worker. 
The peri neb is a neb that we use pretty commonly with cystic fibrosis patients. Um, it's a breath enhanced, which means it nebulizes throughout the breath, so it doesn't necessarily shut off, but it adds flow on inspiration. So this increases the drug delivery 50% and still reduces waste. It's not quite as good as the band neb, but it's essentially a similar concept. The peri neb was specifically designed for tobramycin, which is a very sticky um, medication used with CFRs and has a particle size of less than five microns. Um, you guys still might see these. They've gone away a little bit, um, so I'm not 100% sure how much they'll come up, but they definitely um, are designed for Toby and one you might come into contact with. This I just wanted to show you a picture of. I've only seen it in practice once, but it's kind of interesting. This is a reservoir neb that has like an exhalation port here, but it traps all the medication in this bag so the person can rebreathe all of it. Um, just interesting all the different designs that have come out to really increase that respirable dose and um, decrease the environmental impact there. So why do you start an aerosol therapy? So it really depends. Um, bronchospasming or wheezing is that probably one of the more common ones, especially in TC. If you have a decreased peak expiratory flow rate, um, history of COPD, history of asthma, history of cystic fibrosis, inflammation or mucosal edema. You can do it prophylactically. We'll talk a little bit about pentaminine when we get into specialty nebs. And then also there's antibiotics that we can nebulize for patients um, with really specific lung conditions and that we do commonly. The optimal technique for using a small volume neb Big thing, you're going to assess your patient for signs, symptoms, breath sounds. This may seem really simple, but you'll get called to do nebulizers on patients where it's, it's not appropriate. The patient doesn't need that. Maybe they need Lasix or maybe they need uh, hyperinflation or something else. So you are the expert and it's your job to decide if this is a patient that would benefit from the particular nebulizer that they ordered. Um, you're obviously going to pick your mask or mouthpiece. Always choose the mouthpiece if possible. Uh, using a conserving system, so making sure that you're using the appropriate neb. Um, you want to make sure you put the drug aseptically in the nebulizer, and what that means is like just being very careful about where your fingers are going, not having them go in the cup, making sure that you don't put the tip of the medication in the cup, just trying to be as clean as possible because this is something the patient's going to inhale. And again, those larger micron sizes, like when we we're talking about with COVID, they do carry viruses. They can carry bacteria. Not something you want your patient to be inhaling. You're going to set your gas flow to the manufacturer recommendations, which we already said was eight because it's between that six to 10. Coach your patient to breathe slowly through their mouth at a normal tidal volume. And then you're going to continue the treatment until it begins to sputter. Rinse the nebulizer with sterile water and or air dry between treatments. So with uh, duonebs, albuterol, you just have to turn it over and let it air dry. There are some um, medications where you do have to rinse them because they have a stickiness factor that can kind of gum up the nebulizer. You're going to monitor the patient for an adverse response. So you guys have learned in pharmacology what some of those adverse responses are. With albuterol and duonab, the big thing that you're looking at is heart rate. If they go, if they have an increased heart rate of 20 beats per minute, you want to make sure that you're watching that. Discontinue therapy if necessary. That's something you're going to start assessing when you start the treatment. So you can leave the pulse ox on and watch that, or you can take a manual pulse, but that's going to be a big one that we're going to pay attention to. You're going to assess the outcome. So listening to breath sounds. So if you have a patient that you haven't seen before, if you have a patient that doesn't regularly do these at home, it's up to you to kind of decide how effective they are, how many more they might need, the frequency that they need them. And you do that by listening to breath sounds. You can measure Measure it by measuring a peak flow. Um, in PFT clinic, they'll actually measure an FEV1. Um, these are all things that we can do to figure out how successful that medication is for that patient. This is just a chart that shows you when you're listening to the NEB and it starts to sputter and you, um, you know, end the and the nebulizing treatment. This just shows you that after that sputtering begins and you end up in that residual volume area, if you look at the output, 
it goes way, way down. And the only reason I point this one out is because sometimes it looks like there's still a decent amount in that nebulizer cup and it can be misleading and patients will sometimes even ask you if it's done. So obviously let it run for a little bit after the sputter, but your output goes way, way down once it starts to sputter because you've hit that residual volume or that dead volume. Um, so when do you stop? Again, when the sputter starts to happen, your treatment's complete. Any adverse reactions, the three S's, if you have an adverse reaction where your patient has something severe enough, you stop, stabilize, and stay, and then you're going to call the doctor. So this one is a big board question. They'll have you giving a medication. Your patient will have something kind of wonky happen. Usually it's decently severe, usually cardiac related. And what they're looking for is that you stop, you stabilize your patient, and you call the MD. Heart rate increasing or decreasing greater than 20 from baseline. Some people can have really severe bronchospasms. Um, obviously not so much from the Duonib or Albuterol, but there's other medications that we deliver. Headache, nervousness, tremors, insomnia, those are some of the secondary effects that people might tell you that they have. That um, You could switch them to something like Zopinex, which gives you all of the same benefits as albuterol and duoneb, but doesn't have the same side effects. So these are all things that we have to be aware of and kind of paying attention to. Hazards of aerosol therapy in general. So you have your adverse reaction, which is one of the more immediate things that'll happen. Um, airway reactivity, that's that bronchospasm. And again, that's not so much with the albuterol or duoneb. That's more with like the pulmicorts or the tobies or things that are aerosolized that are not necessarily bronchodilators. Um, you can have pulmonary and systemic side effects. You can have infection. Again, this is an aerosolized medication that has the ability to carry viruses and bacterias. The drug concentration or if it's a continuous nebulizer. So we sometimes deliver very, very high concentrations of albuterol or duoneb because of either hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, excuse me, or because a patient's severely asthmatic. So in those patients, you want to be watching them even closer because you're starting to get to higher concentrations where those side effects are going to be more likely to happen. Eye irritation, so caution with the face mask, you can get more in your eyes. Ibotropium bromide, um, for some people, can cause blurred vision or worsening of glaucoma because of its effect on the eyes. And then just the secondhand exposure, again, the fact that we breathe in a lot of these medications all the time. Um, infection control, so this is something that we're kind of in charge of, making sure those nebulizers are staying clean and um, our technique is aseptic. So tapping out that excess fluid, allowing it to air dry or rinse with sterile water. Don't use tap water. Change the neb. Um, that's going to be based on hospital policy, how often you do that. Do not touch the inside of the med cup with hands or med vials. Advantages and disadvantages of a small volume nebulizer. Advantages are and this is advantages over like an MDI or DPI. Um, so for a small volume nebulizer, the advantages are you don't need as much patient coordination. So young, old, distressed, almost anybody can do a version of a neb. You don't have to coach them on their breathing pattern or do a breath hold. Um, so that's a very big advantage. Um, you can nebulize a ton of different kinds of drugs. So you can target a lot of different things. Um, you can mix drugs and deliver them in one treatment. So that can be really helpful. You can modify the dose and they can have a normal breathing pattern. So they can breathe however they're comfortable and still get a, diff a decent amount of that medication. Disadvantages are you need a pressurized gas source or other power source. Um, equipment for home use can be large, cumbersome, or expensive. There's the potential for drug delivery in the eyes, and then there's a the potential for contamination. Again, these are aerosols, so there's like an infection risk for these. When to use an SVN. So if you have the choice, and this is important for your boards or any other exam, if you have the choice and your patient is appropriate, you're going to use an MDI or a DPI first. Um, cost, it makes sense. Convenience, it makes sense. That is always going to be the first choice. So whether you're talking about albuterol or a steroid or whatever you're talking about, if you can use a meter dose inhaler or a dry powder inhaler, that is what you are going to use. That is going to be the right answer to the question. 
where you choose your SVN is if you have a respiratory rate that's greater than 25, and I should keep just making these greater than or equal to. A lot of time it doesn't land on 25, but if it was exactly 25, you would go SVN as well. So high respiratory rates, you're gonna choose an SVN, and that's because you can't coordinate or do a breath hold as well if you're tachypneic. If you're unable to coordinate an MDI and follow instructions, so that's a lot of our population that has dementia or strokes or different things that just make it difficult for them to coordinate those effectively. If you can't hold your breath for 10 seconds, you are no longer a good candidate for an MDI or DPI. And just some medications are only available in a solution. So then obviously you're going to look to your SVN. So these are kind of like your big things to look at in patient case scenarios when you're trying to make a decision as to what you would give. And that wraps it up for that. And then we'll kind of talk more about the MDI DPIs on the next PowerPoint.